So welcome everybody. Good to see you all here for what will be a very interesting and stimulating talk today. Uh, so um, welcome to our online audience. Um, nice to fill the, the house. Uh, before we introduce our speaker, I'm going to give you a few highlights for the rest of the semester's uh, guest lecture series, which uh, continues to be an excellent series. Uh, next Monday, on February 27th, we'll hear from Patrick Danahy, who is our Design Innovation Fellow in the Architecture Department, and he's going to be presenting an overview of his work, which is uh, uh, fascinating and, and is uh, really uh, breaking some ground for us actually campus-wide in the virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, what we call extended reality realm. On uh, March 20th, we'll have a very special evening. Dr. Billy Fleming uh, from the Ian McCarg Institute at Penn is going to be here to deliver our first Ethan Whitehead Memorial Guest Lecture in Sustainability. Many of you knew Ethan, uh, one of our students who uh, unexpectedly passed away and his family has uh, built this uh, event and, uh, and is funding it and will be here to join us. And uh, Dr. Fleming is, is going to be focused on sustainability and giving us uh, um, his perspective that I think will be appealing to a, a broad audience. On April 3rd, John Rasick and uh, urban planning grad Adam Thies will present on the work of Mies van der Rohe in the state of Indiana. And then finally on April 10th, Clover Lee from Hong Kong will be here to share work from her studio. So a great lineup. Uh, please keep coming to these events. And uh, with that, I will hand uh, the mic over to uh, Tim Gray, who will introduce today's guest. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, our guest today, uh, Chat Pong Chirudamal, obtained his Bachelor of Arts in Architecture from UC Berkeley in 1994 and his Master of Architecture from Harvard University uh, in 2000. After completing his studies in the US, Chat returned to his birthplace of Bangkok uh, to form Chat Architects, a practice combining research and design, resulting in innovative multi-scalar projects that aim to stimulate community through strategies that reinterpret authentic local conditions. In 2015, he created Chat Lab, a research think tank aimed at discovering new Thai vernacular uh, street typologies, affectionately referred to as the Bangkok Bastards. Gotta like that name. Um, Chat has taught at a number of places, taught studios uh, at the National Uni University of Singapore, uh, has taught at Chula, Chula, you just told Longcorn. me how to say this. Chula Longcorn. Chula Longcorn. Perfect. University uh, in Bangkok and at the MIT School of Architecture. Uh, in 2020, Chat received Thailand's Slip, Slip a Thorn Award, the country's highest award for contemporary artists, presented by the Ministry of Culture in Thailand. He was also awarded uh, the Gold Medal for Thailand's Emerging Architect in 2017, presented by the Association of Siamese Architects under royal patronage. In 2020, the Samsung Street Hotel won an Indie Award Building of the Year for the Asia Pacific region. Chet's work has been exhibited both home and abroad, including Japan's Toto Gallery, Ma, in the 30th anniversary exhibition entitled The Asian Every Day in 2015. Uh, Chet's uh, work and the Bangkok Bastards were also a recent uh, subject of an article by Aaron Betsky uh, that appeared in Architecture Magazine. Aaron Betsky, some of you may know, is the architecture critic for the New York Times. So uh, we're, I'm delighted to welcome Chet and uh, we'll uh, uh, please give him a round of applause and look forward to learning more about your work. Thank you. thank you so much, Tim. Everybody can hear me okay in the back? And thank you so much, Dave. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here at Ball State. Um, I'm especially honored to be here because of my friend Tim, who I respect 
uh, very much, and I'm, I'm glad to be able to reunite with him. So today, I'm going to tell you about Bangkok through the eyes of things that I love, and I think that's the only introduction you need. So let's start with this little film. So here you have, it's very, I do research and I do design. They cross over. I'll be showing both research and design, switching back and forth from one another because that's the way I work. This is a shot from Samut Prakan, a little canal community near where I live. And let's just see what's happening. Okay. So this, we have these two boats, long tail boats. It's a normal vernacular way of transport. And um, I mean, switch forward a little bit. Um, what you're gonna see now is that as one boat is pulled to the side, I think that's a favorite, the, the, the tool that architects use. And I just use plan sections and drawings and isometrics to kind of tell the story of architecture in Thailand. So here you see an isometric of these two boats. It tells the story how it becomes a bridge, but I also draw the dirty water. I draw the corrugated sheets. Uh, I draw the river, the stray dogs. All these things make up architecture in Thailand, contextually. This section tells the story of how uh, the gentleman would give a little slack to the red rope so that the boats can pass and that it doesn't get entangled in the propellers. We also look at details of how each uh, pulley system is attached to the rope. So in essence, by drawing, I start to make connections between urbanism, architecture, and detail. And I call, I always create little names for these things. This one's called a bridge boat. And these, this is an example of what I call uh, Bangkok bastards. I call them bastards because what is a bastard? Somebody who doesn't know who their father is, somebody who's without kind of cre credibility, um, without a history, or without a past. To me, a building that's called a bastard is the same thing. It could be something that is built by a non-architect. could be a slum, a shanty town, a food cart. It's made out of salvage materials. It's not design per se, but it's architecture that's made by everyday people to solve everyday problems. Right? Another example of a Bangkok bastard that I've been studying for over 10 years is a construction worker house. In Thailand, when a developer wants to build a condominium or an apartment, the contractor or the construction workers live on site. Right? And so they're tasked with the idea of building their own worker dorms using salvage materials on site, whether they're uh, leftover two by fours or steel tubes or corrugated sheets. This elevation makes me very happy. <laughs> Most Bangkokians would say, oh, that's messy. It's full of trash. But to me, it's, it's a very authentic elevation that shows life, right? There's clothes hanging. Um, you can tell the activities are happening on this kind of walkway. But in order to understand this more, we have to go in and photograph and draw, right? And we start to understand when we draw that this work, uh, construction worker house is composed of two elements. The core, which you see on the bottom, a very stuffy, claustrophobic, hot, two, you know, two meter by two meter rooms that are, aren't very pleasant. But what makes them livable is a scaffolding on top. This veranda that works as a multi-purpose space for cooking, eating, washing laundry, getting drunk, the things that happen in life. So if this is a system, 
that we found out from the studying these bastards, we start to see how the construction workers utilize the system to, to solve other problems. For example, as you see here, um, this is a scaffolding that has a, a double roof, right? In order to protect the lower roof from flying, falling debris, wrenches and hammers that could be falling from the construction site. So as you can see, once we do a little is explode isometric, you see how this scaffolding has been uh, hacked in order to solve this problem of a secondary kind of helmet that protects the, uh, the house. Uh, this should be on the cover of Architecture Magazine, but it's just a simple, beautiful, streamlined construction worker house. But instead of having a veranda on the outside, it's a double-loaded corridor. But nonetheless, I call this a shish kebab or the satay. The scaffolding is still a wind tunnel that uh, the construction workers sit there and cook, wash laundry, and there's constant airflow. Once the workers start to understand the system, they utilize it. Uh, in, to, in order to create housing. So you have core, scaffolding, core, scaffolding. And then they start to play with the details. Corrugated sheet, a lengthwise piece is folded into a V, it becomes a gutter that also reflects reflected light onto the underside of corrugated ceiling. Another subject, a little controversial, but just as interesting, is what we call the curtain sex motel. <laughs> uh, it's an Others may not know from the outside, but locals walk past or drive past and they have a little smile on their face because locals know what happens inside. Let me tell you what happens inside. So this is a typical beautiful, look at this beautiful piece of architecture. Brissolé in the front. Corbu could have built this, right? But there's always a tunnel in front of a curtain sex motel where uh, the patron is usually could be a man, older man, could be a woman, who comes in a darkly tinted car, usually has a partner on the side, not the wife or the husband, as you can imagine. So they drive the car through this tunnel. Sometimes a tunnel is very scary. <laughs> but it leads to an open court, an internal courtyard, surrounded by red or blue or green curtains. Once the car drives in, the attendant opens the curtains, the car drives into the parking slot. And at the end of the parking slot, there is a little love suite where the guests go in and play cards for 15 minutes, two hours, I don't know. When they're finished playing cards, they back out. There's a secret exit in the alley that allows them to leave unnoticed because wife or husband could be waiting at the front door. An architect designed this, unnamed. So I diagrammed this for you, so you make sure you understand this. <laughs> These are the things that I study in Bangkok. Um, and hopefully, one day, all this research uh, leads to something interesting in terms of design, which in this case, it did. This is Papa Tony. He owns the previous love motel called the Picnic Hotel. All these love motels have very cute, innocuous names. This one is called the Picnic Hotel. So Papa Tony allowed me to go inside and survey his love motel with a promise of chat. You go in, you may be able to redesign this and turn it into a boutique, boutique hotel. Unfortunately, I was heartbroken, and he demolished it, this beautiful piece of architecture, and instead put up a neoclassical hotel kind of broke my heart. But four years later, he said, Chad, I bought another sex motel. You want to do this one? <laughs> this one's called the Mit Paisan Curtain Motel, translated to the Friendship Motel, right? The, the Mit Paisan Curtain Motel led to the Samsung Street Hotel, the first design which I'll be showing you. This is Papa Tony, the young man with the unbuttoned shirt. This is him at the age of 21. Even though he's right now a curtain love motel mogul, he started off by selling street food, Thai iced coffee, with his wife who's behind the cart. In doing so, he collected money, kind of built himself up, saved enough money to buy a taxi, eventually making enough money to become a manager in a tailor shop, and eventually opening up his own chain of tailor shops, and then buying real estate. 
And in doing so, the self-made man was able to buy the Friendship Motel and allowed me to renovate it. So this is a kind of a aerial photograph of this hotel with a courtyard in the middle, uh, that's standard courtyard. It has a stereotypical tunnel in front. It, the courtyard itself is a little bit small. We kind of demolished one set of rooms to create, uh, to create a larger, bigger outdoor room. But the problem with Curtin Love Motels is they're very small rooms. So three meters by three meters, very small. You'll have to, I'm in the metric system, so you have to figure out how, just, it's small. <laughs> Papa Tony said, chat, I gotta make money on this and I can't put a lot of money into renovations or doing new structure. How do I fit not only two people into a room, but three people? Because I can charge 600 baht more per an extra head. So I said, oh, Papa Tony, that's tough. Without putting any new foundations, this is what I propose. I told him, let's put in a bed box. We'll cantilever it out of the existing structure, which we did. So these are the little sleeping boxes that is cantilevered out of existing bedrooms on exist, with existing structure. Checked on with the, uh, the structural engineer, no problem. So if this were the existing structure, uh, stripped off of its brisole, we would add these extruded bed boxes for each room. These extrusions are minimal to kind of cut down costs. The interior clearance is 1.2 meter by two meter, so a twin size bed. So an adult can sleep in these uh, sleep boxes. So with these minimal additions, what happens is I have these little gaps that are left in between these extrusions or bay windows, which are then filled with the scaffolding, the scaffolding that I told you about. But this scaffolding creates new opportunities. It's a scaffolding that turns a once dark, mysterious, introverted love motel inside out into a new, lively street hotel that activates the dilapidated red light district neighborhood. The scaffolding is divided into three elements, the porch, the alley, and the outdoor theater. Uh, the soy, which means uh, an alley, is the first scaffolding. So with this scaffolding, we're trying to solve a very mundane problem in Bangkok or in Southeast Asia. I would have these developer clients come to me and say, I have this empty building. Don't worry about the plan, I already have a plan for it because I've already maximized profit in creating these uh, very efficient plans. Just do a beautiful facade, right? And um, with these facades, please put in balconies because foreigners love balconies. If you live in Bangkok, you do not go out on the balcony. There's a lot of pollution, a lot of noise. So it isn't something like in Europe or in America where you can go out and hang out. It becomes a place where you store your air condensers your MEP system, so it becomes, when you have a problem with your air conditioning unit, the repairman always has to come and knock on your door, walk through your bedroom to go service this. So this new alley, vertical alley scaffolding allows repairmen to climb and service all the MEP systems in the building, but it also has another surprise function, which I'll show you later. Or is it, oh, here it is. So you see kind of this vertical uh, circulation of the existing building. Oops. Um, this kind of temporary stair that accesses the scaffolding um, is inspired by, which you may or may not know, have you ever wondered, even in America, you have these tall canopies for gas stations. I always wondered how they change the light bulbs <laughs> with lights on top. So I went and looked behind at kind of a back corner of a gas station and found this wonderful stair. It's a basically a light bulb changing stair that allows you to change light bulbs in gas stations in Thailand. It became kind of a bastard prototype for this new stair. The porch scaffolding uh, solves a problem of maximizing space that's usually uh, underutilized. It's called the setback area between the property line and the building itself that usually becomes flooded with garbage and trash. But here, um, we try to utilize this and create a space where there's a connection between the hotel guests and the locals, right? Again, we go back to Papa Tony, who always thought about his 
pass as a food vendor. He has kind of a soft spot for the food vendors, especially the, na the neighbors that sell. Um, this is Brother Chicken, translated literally. That's his name. Um, all Thais have nicknames. This, and his name is uh, Brother Chicken. And this is his armada of Thai sausages, which are sold right next to the hotel. So we went and talked to Brother Chicken and said, how, is there a way we can create a new business model where we can actually send guests down for breakfast instead of having them eat eggs and sausages, a typical continental breakfast, why don't we send them out and have a Thai authentic street food breakfast? In that sense, we create a new economy, a new business so that guests pay money and you create income for the, for, for the vendors. And then you're able to brand the hotel as an authentic street food hotel. So there is a symbiotic relationship in creating a new program. This is another, this is a sister tip who also creates pot thai uh, next door that you can have as lunch. We're also trying to solve another problem. A few years ago, the prime minister of Thailand decided they want to use Singapore as the model where they tried to clean up the streets of the food vendors because they thought the foreigners thought that it was messy and it was uncivilized, which is, is not a really good idea because food vendors is a part of Thai culture. And if you kind of ship them away and put them in a food court that's too far away from their homes, that whole system of economics doesn't work. So we're trying to find a way to accommodate both, to create order as well as to uh, allow for the food vendors to survive and, and maintain this cultural phenomenon of street food. So as a part of the program, uh, we also designed this mobile furniture, whether they're so folding stools or folding tables, food carts that allow guests to sit on the sidewalk. In Thailand, architecture isn't defined just by roof, floors, and, and, and walls. But mobile furniture, plastic chairs, as you'll see with the trips that some of you will be going to Southeast Asia, even Christmas lights create space, right? So this is a shot of the opening, the soft opening of um, the, the hotel, where Sister Tip can actually come in and sell her food on private property of the hotel and is not chased, by, chased away by the local police. Remember what I told you about this, the vertical alley? On weekends and festivals, it turns into a vertical concert stage that allows the hotel to deliver street music to, to the neighborhood. So here's a little shot of that. still a hotel, not just kind of a party scene. When you go into the hotel lobby, uh, the reception table is kind of influenced by local uh, detailing. These are kind of bastardized uh, burglar grills that you see on the neighbors next door. We create a new type of street graphics because we didn't have much money <laughs> in our budget to do signage, so we just created graphics on this kind of epoxy floor that create little lanes so that once you come out of your elevator, you figure out which room number you're in, and then you follow the trail of breadcrumbs or the street lanes to your, to your room. Each room, again, like I told you, has a little bed box. This one's elevated. Can you guys guess why? This is a, a sectional question. It's a little loft because it's lifted because this is the bed box. It allows for the path for the mechanical people to pass under below, right? 
This hotel still has the special tunnel, but the tunnel leads to a new experience, an outdoor movie theater, as well as a, a lounge pool, not a swimming pool, a lounge pool with benches on, th on three sides that allow you to watch a movie. But we designed a special type of balcony called the leg dangling balcony that forces you to look out, watch the movie, but also to look out and look at each other, look at either of the guests there. If you are, are able to visit, hopefully, you'll find the acoustics in this hotel is really amazing because strangers would shout across the courtyard to have a conversation. On top of that, we want to, basically the outdoor movie came from a tradition of outdoor movies that would happen at uh, Buddhist temples in Thailand. So it's a revival of a new tradition, in a new, uh, an old tradition in a new way. Even the stair landings become opera seats where you can watch uh, movies. We also have a special feature. There's a little pulley system. You press a button and it delivers a basket full of popcorn and snacks while you're uh, watching a movie. So in essence, this scaffolding, even though it doesn't look like this scaffolding, are from the same DNA. Okay, so I showed you a project in, uh, in the city. So the past four years, we've had more projects outside the city in the rural areas. So we're gonna switch from Bangkok bastards to rural crossbreeds. Um, I'm proud to present this project for the first time. We just finished this project last week and just got a photograph. So excuse, excuse me if I mess up a little bit. I've never presented this project before. Um, a project four years in the making uh, in working with a fisherman of a local fisherman's colony called Ang Sila, about an hour away from, from Bangkok. So, so Bangkok is about here. <laughs> it's about an hour and, fifth, hour and a half ride, car ride, to this yellow spot here, which is this historic fishing village of Ang Sila. As you can see from the urban plan, it's a beautiful roof plan. You can see these small little alleys, these organic alleys that lead to the sea. You stand in these alleys and you see, feel the breezes coming through because of the planning of these streets that are perpendicular with the, with the coastline. And these are the villagers uh, that we work with in order to kind of create new economic opportunities for kind of a dwindling, uh, kind of a, a, a suffering fisheries uh, economy in Ang Sila, which used to be very thriving. I'm going to show you a little movie that describes the atmosphere of Ang Sila. So it's about a six minute a mini movie that describes uh, the kind of the community here. เราจะทําเป็นเอกชนสอนด้วยแล้วก็เป็นอาจารย์สอนด้วยแล้วก็เป็นนักวิจัยผมชอบศึกษาทัศนธรรมวิถีชีวิตของชุมชนต่างๆ
ไอทองไปไม่ต้องเอาอะไรมาเอาตัวกับตัวใจมากินอย่างเดียวพอบางคนเอาไม่กินไอ้ดูปั๊บเนี่ยมึงกินเอาไม่ดีขายไม่ใครเลยเราชอบไม่ต้องละเอียดมากแบบทางๆเลยมีแกงคั่วปูทะเลแล้วก็ปูทะเลผัดกระไดทองแกงคั่วสับปะรดใส่ไข่มุกดาแมงกะพรุนลวกกิมแล้วก็ปลากระเบนชุบน้ำปลาน้ำตาลตาแล้วเดี๋ยวแมงดาฉากเป็นของหวานอีกอย่างเป็นของหวานอ่านั่งกินอย่างไรบ้านแคบหน่อยก็นะไม่เป็นไรหรือเราจะเป็นแต่กินอย่างนี้จะดีกว่าเราทํากินกันเองเราทําได้เยอะผมอยากทำให้กอดเบนบอกปลาบอกกุ้งทั้งนั้นเลยนะโอ้แล้วพอหน้าฝนเนี่ยพอน้ําพอหน้าฝนพอก็เข้าเข้าเดือนสิบเด็ดเนี่ยมันจะขึ้นไปไข่เออตามถนนเนี่ยมันตายสมัยก่อนเป็นยังไงกันเป็นถนนทุกรางไม่เคยให้เขามาช่วยเลยให้เขาไปตั้งใจเรียนอย่างเดียวพอมีลูกมีหลานแม่สอนแม่ทําทะเลเลยระบบน้ํามันไม่ดีพอระบบนิเวศมันเสียลูกหอยแคงมันก็ไม่เกิดเราหอยที่เราเลี้ยงไว้มันก็ตายพอตายปั๊บเราก็ต้องหยุดอาชีพประมงไม่ดีเนี่ยไม่ยั่งยืนเพราะเดี๋ยวนี้บ้านคนมันเยอะตึกเยอะอะไรเยอะถามบําบัดน้ํามันบางไหมมันเกี่ยวระบบนิเวศหมดทะเลโอเค so that's a little introduction to the community as you can see um, it's a vibrant community with a lot of cultural tradition the problems they're finding right now which is shared by a lot of uh, seaside communities is water pollution all over the world a suffering seafood population but it's also hampered by what we call the middleman uh, phenomenon they would catch fresh fish clams oysters whatever and they would sell it to the middleman Who would then hike up the prices, and then perhaps sit on it for a day or two, and then deliver it to the markets. But by that time, the problem is some of the fresh seafood becomes almost spoiled, and so the seafood community in Angsila, which used to be very successful in my parents' time, we would go buy crabs. They'd have it steam right there. We bring bring it home to eat. Now what happens is a lot of customers go. They buy the uh, the crabs or the oysters that are steamed, and they bring it back, and it's spoiled. And then customers think the fishermen are trying to rip us off, but that's not really the case because sometimes it's been sitting with the middleman in storage for a day or two, which in seafood terms, it's a long time. So what do we do in trying to kind of solve this problem, and trying to create a new economy, so that the fishermen can sell seafood directly to the customers and create a new experience? So let me talk to you, tell you about that with a small little research mini movie as well. It's only three minutes. This is going to be an introduction to the oyster scaffolding, a research we've did, we've, we've done for the past four years. <laughs>
เป็นลูกหอยแล้วครับอันนี้ลูกหอยยังยังยังยังไม่โตทีเดียวยังไม่เต็มไวทำไมก่อนจะเลี้ยงเป็นหอยชิ้นจะเลี้ยงหอยเกาะธรรมชาติมาเกาะเองอะไรเองเดี๋ยวนี้ก็พัฒนามาก็มาเลี้ยงแบบนี้มันเก็บเกี่ยวได้ง่ายกว่าเพราะมันไม่ได้เก็บจากธรรมชาติธรรมชาติเพราะว่าตัวนี้มันคือมาถึงเอามีตัดขึ้นแต่ที่หอยหินต้องคอยน้ําแห้งแล้วทุกทีละตัวทีละตัวทีละตัวอันนี้ตัวนี้แล้วมาเลี้ยงข้างนอกเนี่ยตัวมันจะโตเร็วกว่าคิดว่ากระชังหอยเนี่ยมันมีความสำคัญกับชาวกีฬาเยอะตอนนี้เยอะเพราะอาชีพประมงตอนนี้ถ้าเพราะเลี้ยงหอยนี่ถือว่าตอนนี้มันจะน่าจะดีคือมันขายง่ายตอนนี้อาหารทะเลของทะเลมันขายยากชาวบ้านเรามันเป็นคนเอาสิ่งที่ได้เปรียบในตําแหน่งเนี้ยมันคืออะไรคือตําแหน่งเนี้ยมันเป็นแบบเป็นพื้นที่แบบน้ําไม่เค็มจัดเพราะหอยพวกนี้ถ้าไม่มีน้ําจืดเลยมันก็จะไม่ค่อยโตรถตัวมันก็จะไม่ค่อยอ้วนเมื่อต้นขั้นตอนในการสร้างเนี้ยมันเริ่มจากขั้นตอนไหนก่อนขั้นตอนคือสั่งไม้มาแล้วก็จะมาปักปักตัวนี้ก่อนปักตัวนี้ตั้งแถวตั้งแถวให้มันตรงตั้งแถวปับ๊บพอตั้งแถวปับ๊บแถวต่อไปแถวต่อไปปับ๊บแล้วตัวต่อไปเขาก็จะวางคานเขาจะวางคานยาวก่อนแล้วก็จะวางกว่าพอฟางเสร็จปับ๊บเขาก็จะไปเอาสายเดียวเนี่ยมาพาดพาดพาดพาดพาดถูกล็อกไว้แล้วก็พอถึงเวลาตัวเนี้ยเขาก็จะเอามาสั่งมาแล้วก็จะมาแยกแล้วก็จะตัวเนี้ยมันจะมาเป็นโพงใหญ่เขาก็จะแยกเป็นน้อยเส้นแล้วก็จะมามัดมัดมัดเรียงแบบที่เราทําที่ก็ทำแบบนี้ก็ทำเขาเลี้ยงข้างบนหอยลมข้างล่างนี่หอยมังคุก็จะประมาณ2เมตรเมตรสเมตรหอยมังคุสามารถเอามาซื้อไม้ได้เออมาซื้อไม้ได้หอยมังคุตัวนี้แพงด้วยเออเพื่อนว่าการนี้มันคือมันพอพอมันเลี้ยงหอยแทนที่ต้องไปจับเป็นธรรมชาติมันก็เลยง่ายกว่าง่ายการคุมการประมงอย่างดีใช่ไหมอย่างนี้ยังดีเลยตอนนี้ตอนนี้หอยนุ่งลมดีสมัยก่อนทางเพชรบุรีทางนู้นเขาไม่เลี้ยงกันนะนี้เขาเลี้ยงกันหมดเลยตอนนี้สิ่งที่เราจะมาดูวันนี้ก็คือถ้าเราทําอย่างนี้มันเหมือนไม้ไผ่อาจจะต้องมาทำยาวต้องยาวแล้วหอยเป็นคู่กับคือมีต้องมีเตามีเตามาแล้วก็ยางสดสดอย่างนั้นหอยนุ่งลมนี่ก็ยางได้นะลมนี่ก็ยางเวลาเนื้อมันแหงมันจะหอมตรงนี้พวกหอยพวกนี้พอธรรมชาติปั๊บ So we talked about how wonderful will it be to bring people out to the oysters, pick your own oysters and have an oyster meal on the ocean on the scaffolding. So that was the inspiration for this new project. New project, but four years in the making. So as you can see, we did a lot of research. This is a plan of Ang Sila. We re research various uh, in interesting vernacular buildings um, uh, on the coast, but we also went out into the sea in order to uh, research kind of aqua architecture. And one of them was the seafood, sca the oyster scaffolding. So we went out, measured them, drew them, modeled them to really understand the construction techniques that are all locally done. Contractors don't do this. The fishermen do this themselves. They order their own bamboo from Ryong, ship it in, and they go out with a team of four people, and they can erect the scaffolding within two weeks. And um, the oysters are grown from strings on top. Mussels attach themselves two meters below, so there are two shellfish that are raised on the on the bamboo scaffolding. We modeled in 3D to really understand. Another bastard that's very interesting is called the oyster farm outpost. It looks like this. These oyster farms are full of oysters and mussels, which can be sold for hundreds and thousands of dollars. So, what happens is there are oyster pirates that come at night, who come and kind of cut the strings off and make off with the oysters. So these oyster outposts are security guards that go out and stay overnight. In order to protect the oyster scaffolding, but one ingenious fisherman decided to charge 75 bucks a head to stay out in this oyster scaffolding as a new uh, ocean hotel. So, at the risk of your life, you can stay out there in the ocean overnight. But it gave us the idea of how you can actually occupy an oyster scaffolding. Of course, because it has to uh, uh, kind of withstand more weight, there's more bamboo scaffolding that's needed for an occupied structure. There's actually a little fishing pier that allows you to fish, hang out, a little bathroom, a little kitchenette. 
So we also drew this up, trying to understand the construction techniques, all the cross beams. And here again, you see how they use these defective, cheap Nissan, Honda, Hyundai car seat belts to, to tie these posts together. So in studying these two kind of hybrids, the oyster scaffolding and the farm outposts, we start to bastardize them. We start to see how we can hybridize this to create a new experience to design the Angsila seafood dining scaffolding to create a new ocean to table dining experience where you can go out and eat fresh, fresh oysters and learn about the ecology. So if you're a guest, hopefully one of you guys or a few of you guys will come out. Uh, Uncle Jun, uh, the sh uh, fisherman, will take you out on his boat. Creating, he'll make more money in order to, to, to create a tour package. So he makes extra money uh, in, in order to take guests out on his little trip uh, to the oyster scaffolding. Once you do, first you'll pass by uh, this kind of urbanism of incredible bamboo scaffolding that's organized in rows, almost like alleys in the ocean. But this, this was just taken last Sunday, um, and it was the first time we kind of uh, put up the red tarp. So. really hard you guys <laughs> I'm sure you guys scream in studio like that as well um, okay so the boat will take you up to the entry canopy where you can get off once you ascend the scaffolding you'll pass by this tunnel of red tarp that filters sunlight uh, but also encloses and protects you from the strong wind you walk down the plankway, and then there are little tents on each side to accommodate four people to have a, a, a chill dining experience. At the end, the triple canopy becomes a, uh, an open-air kitchen for the chef. So what happens is, this is the kitchen area. And then, when we start to prepare, uh, the chef or the, or the oyster fisherman goes down and pulls up the oysters. right? I think sound is very important for us. This is when the water goes down and the oysters are revealed. Sometimes when the water is up, you can't see them. So they pull the oysters up. The oysters are cleaned. They go into a pot. We have some oysters. Uh, this is the, oh, so these are mussels. And then there's a prepared and served, so you have in this particular menu, a little bit international. Uh, so we have uh, mussels uh, in white wine sauce, oysters with Thai seafood uh, sauce, squid in black ink. Are you guys getting hungry? <laughs> and then you dine with a view of the scaffolding and the ocean and a glass of, you know, a bottle of beer. The light quality is quite important for us uh, that you choose this, uh, the tarp that allows transparency and opacity. Again, being with the elements is, is, is very important. So once they're full, they start to lie down on these special triangular Thai, thai pillows. As the sun goes down, we go out around 4 p.m., around 6 p.m., the sun goes down, the quality of light changes. And then it's time to go home. At that time, the water has lowered to about uh, four, 
five feet, and you see the oysters are completely exposed. So you see another aspect of the sea, of the eco you know, ecology. Certain times the light filters through. It almost becomes transparent. I just got these photos two days ago uh, from my photographer who had a, a great drone. So that was a package to create you know, uh, op uh, economic opportunities to, to take guests out, uh, a maximum of 20 people for the scaffolding. But then the day before, the special day, we invited the fishermen to come enjoy the scaffolding themselves because fish come and swarm around the oysters and becomes a great fishing spot. So these, this is a photo from, from the day of the fishing. And this day, the day before, the water was completely calm. So it's a different atmosphere from the first photos you saw. The dr I mean, usually when you have drone shots of architecture, it's usually a roof plan, a cool looking roof plan. But for us, it's really important to understand that this scaffolding is, is part of a big ocean urbanism, right? Here's the boat coming to, to, take, uh, to bring the fishermen to start to fish. And when the sun rose, there's a different quality of light coming from the, the shore. Uncle June right here said, chat, this is a week before we're supposed to open this. I think it'd be cool if I could sleep over here. So can I put in a loft? So he did. <laughs> so, and then he brought his son to, to, to fish. So this is just last week. He, he caught eight fish in, in 20 minutes. So there was a lot of fish swirling around the, the oysters. And we picked the site that's at the edge of the farm so that you have views back into the scaffolding farms but then views out to the vast uh, ocean. Yeah. How am I doing on time? I've got 10 minutes. OK. Yeah, OK. So um, two fast projects. We're still in the countryside, uh, but now we're in Sukhon Nakhon, northeastern part of Thailand. That's, it's more impoverished uh, uh, part of Thailand, but a beautiful part where all the rice for, uh, gr uh, growers are. And my wife, uh, her name is Nong. She's a professor of crafts uh, and industrial design. So she would go out to work with um, indigenous people uh, with textiles. So this is her right here and her team of um, craft researchers. They would go out and I would follow them because there's always cool stuff whenever they go. So <laughs> this is, she told me not to show this picture, but she would teach uh, uh, young school children different ways of um, um, uh, uh, doing textiles. So this is a course where she taught disabled um, um, villagers. Um, this uh, beautiful woman is uh, mentally disabled. Uh, this gentleman has no hands, but was the best at dyeing, meaning doing national dyes. So all these textiles are tie dye with bark and flowers and all completely non-synthetic and natural dyes. So in doing that, we learn so much. And well, my son and I, like I said, would tag along. This is from a few years ago. He's almost going to be going to, going to college now. But this is the time when we went and tagged along with mom, start to dye indigo and learn about textiles. And in doing so, I start to see a connection between textiles and architecture. Right? So this is a, a Sukhonakon is known for its indigo dyes. And so in studying the textiles, I start to become fascinated with the textile loom, right, right here. And I start to talk to the carpenters, the wood carpenters in Sukhonakon, and uh, to ask about how, uh, my, at that time, my wife wanted to, to kind of get a loom herself. And in talking, we start to understand that carpenters don't make a difference between building looms and building house. You go to a carpenter, the same guy would build a loom would build a house as well. So there is kind of a, a crossover. There's no separation, separation between furniture, objects, and architecture. So as you can see, we start to see that they're all created out of large and small wood members, whether it's the loom on the left or the house on the right. And so we start to do a little research to kind of 
explode the loom into its various parts. At the same time, we start to examine the Thai house and examine its various parts, whether they're columns, beams, ventilation panels, windows and doors, stairs, floorboards. And in doing so, we started to create a new module, what I call the Loom House Bastard Module. So we want to solve a problem right now, as with all craft villages in Thailand and a lot of craft villages throughout Southeast Asia, all the grandmothers and aunties who are getting old are the ones who know about textiles with the craft skills. But the younger generation are escaping to the cities because they want office jobs, they want, you know, contemporary jobs. So there's a vacuum left where there's nobody to take on the tradition of, of textiles and crafts. So this is an opportunity to, again, create a new economy, to create new opportunities for this aging textile craftsmen, craftswomen population. So we create this new module called the Loom House Bastard Module with parts both from the loom and from the house. So this is actually uh, the loom. And so a loom is actually built into one, two, three levels. This is called a pang, a pang, T-A-H-N-G. It's basically the furniture of rural people in Thailand. It's a low platform that you sit on, you nap on, you cook on, you fold laundry. So it's a, a living room per se, but open, open air. So we create a pang module here. Lastly, we create a, a bedroom, which in Thailand is basically just a mosquito net because a lot of locals sleep on mattresses and just, they just need a mosquito net to, to block the, the, the pests. In doing so, we create a new loom condo. This loom condo allows all the grandmothers who right now are isolated in their own, home, own homes, kind of creating textiles by themselves in the underbelly of the house. This is a place where they can come together to create a, a community, but you guys can also, for the price of a very small sum, buy a package where you can come stay for four or five days. You can sleep over, you can grow rice, you can learn textiles, you can dye indigo. And that way, it's a new economy. And this architecture is a new rice bastard architecture that we dreamed of. Uh, we do a lot of projects where we have no clients, and eventually, we find the right clients, just what happened with the uh, seafood scaffolding. So this is a poster I did um, for, for this. Um, so there are quotes from rural rice growers who come into the city and really yearn for their lives in the countryside. For example, I miss my daughter. She's seven now, growing up so fast. I should be there with her, but I can't. So a lot of women from the rural countryside come in to make money and they leave their young children so that the grandparents can take care of them. So that happens a lot, right? Rice farming is hard, hard work, but if I could go back to it, I would. Country people take care of each other, not like in the city where everyone's just looking out for themselves. I miss working with my hands, weaving, dyeing, the scent of indigo fabric is so lovely. There's so much pollution to the city, I miss breathing in the fresh country air. These quotes aren't just common to th Thailand. I think these quotes are common throughout the world, developing world, where people who've been seduced to the city now are starting to realize that rural uh, countryside is, is a really valuable place, and there could be a return to it. So now we're moving from Bangkok bastards to Indiana crossbreeds. This is my little gift to you guys. <laughs> We did this exercise. I think it's, I don't believe in coming to a lecture and just talk about my projects. First and foremost, I feel like I want to educate. So if I come to a place, I wanna feel like I could leave something with you guys that is beneficial. So this Indiana crossbreeds, let's see what's, what's happening here. I was lucky enough to have Professor Tim to help me choose a site <laughs> um, in, in the Indianapolis. Um, so this is a Circle City Industrial Complex, Indianapolis. Raise your hand if you guys know what this is, one or two people. Do you, do you guys ever go and hang out there? Get a beer? We just got a beer yesterday there. So I mean, this is a, a master plan where it's a huge industrial complex and it's being re redeveloped into a kind of 
cultural areas. You, uh, there are class people there now. But it used to be um, the Schwitter factory, right? So these are photos from the 1950s, how this industrial, huge industrial warehouse was operating uh, back in 1950. But now it has a new life. This abandoned structure has a new life, uh, accommodating craftsmen, steel, you know, uh, steel uh, workers and uh, fabricators, uh, art space, pottery. Um, and so this is the huge industrial complex right here. And this is our little site. It's a little void. They basically cut out a void <laughs> in this huge industrial complex to create parking space. <laughs> um, we thought that this is an opportunity to do something interesting. So this is a, a photo from Google Street View, which is an invaluable tool during COVID, no? <laughs> I've researched so much, I, I burned so many hours on Google Street View, just ex traveling the world. So we spent a lot of time looking at, uh, trying to choose the right poetic site, and uh, Tim uh, picked this beautiful site uh, for us to kind of investigate. As you can see, these beautiful sawtooth trusses are being, have been chopped, right? This one is almost like a little canopy for the uh, center point coffee. But this section is quite beautiful, no? The way the light comes in. And on the other side, there's no program, so it's just kind of this beautiful abandoned uh, truss structure. And looking through the lights, the quality of light is, is, is quite beautiful. These were just taken yesterday. So what we thought is, how, what do we do with this kind of void in the city and to, to create new value for it? I wrote this <laughs> to kind of explain to myself how I design. Let me read through it. I do things that I like. <laughs> I don't do things that I think other people will like. I don't do design with the intention of saving the world or trying to be a good Samaritan. If I do, if I do things that I like and approach it with passion, curiosity, truth, and authenticity, the good intention of the project will eventually manifest itself. If I allow my conscience to guide the many decisions that I have to make along the way, again, I do things that I like, even if others may think, what the hell is this guy doing? <laughs> so in this case, what I enjoy, as you saw from earlier, are textiles. I've, I've been fascinated with quilts, American quilts, for many, many years. And doing this project, it allowed me to kind of understand uh, and explore Indiana Amish quilts. <laughs> I see the world of textiles as all being interconnected, whether in Thailand, in China, in Europe, or in America. So let me read this little article on uh, Indiana Amish quilts from Janikin uh, Smucker. In the early 1970s, art enthusiasts began to display Amish quilts from the earliest 20th century on the wall of apartments galleries, antique shops, and museums. Noting how their strong graphics and minimalist designs resemble abstract paintings of the post-World War II period, prior to 1970s, no one really had paired the adjective Amish with the noun quilt. Yet with this cultural dislocation, Amish quilts give, shifted its status from special heirloom bed covers, kept folded in chests and treasured as gifts between family members, to cult objects in demand with the outside world. In looking at quilts, I always, when I were looking at crafts or handicrafts, I always look at how, what the architecture that's associated with is, right? We look at the whole DNA, and it led me to look at the Amish barn and to study the structure, which has very great similarities to the Thai house on stilts, where on the bottom level, on the underside of the house, is where the livestock live, or where the farm tractors are, where the buffalo who plow the rice fields are, similar to Indiana. On the top is another world, right? World where we're stacking hay. And uh, we look to recreate and create a scenario where we would recycle old barn trusses to create a new intervention here. So we would imagine this kind of you know, salvage Indiana barn structure multiplied to create a new intervention where we would bastardize existing light steel industrial structure with this new but old wood architectural structure. 
agricultural structures. And in doing so, create kind of a, a new place of cultural arts intervention where people would come, um, quilters could come, uh, the structure could be blocked and we would create these new trust skylights to create this new space, public space. So this is a floor plan where um, guests would arrive on top and they would see cutouts in the ground where the quilters would make quilts. Um, so in section, we combine these two structures, kind of the barn truss structure with the sawtooth um, industrial structure to create these new tr skylight interventions where light would stream in on this top triangle and views could be had into the existing truss. Again, when we do these bastardizations, there has to be architectural value. <laughs> That's something I want to stress. We just don't do it because it's a good thing for the world. I have to be interested in this intervention as an architect, right? Architecture still matters to me. So we have the bottom level, kind of the workspace behind the scenes. The top level is more of an open, airy space. At the bottom level, we could imagine that the quilts is a work, it's a workshop where quilt makers can make quilts, store their raw materials. At the top, you can look down and see the quilts being made, and during exhibition, it would be lifted up, become an exhibition space for various types of arts, not just quilts. Lastly, I thought we could do a Thai Indiana textile exchange where we bring textiles, uh, uh, indigenous people, <laughs> people who love textiles, bring in their looms and start to create some textiles here in Indiana to create a new type of quilt created from Thai textiles. Uh, to create a new kind of collaboration between cultures. Thank you so much. Uh, thank everybody. Uh, I thank everybody for coming. Uh, I know it's a busy time of the semester and we ran a little late. Um, so I think we'd probably be best off maybe taking questions outside. I'm sure. Uh, we can have a little reception. If you have questions, you can talk direct with chat. And I also want to uh, uh, say I'm delighted that a group of students and myself are going to be going to uh, visit chat in Bangkok this summer and uh, look forward to seeing some of this stuff and look forward to strengthen ties in the future and more opportunities uh, for our students to go over and, and uh, have a cross-cultural exchange. Looking so again, th thank you very much. Thank you and, so much. Uh, we'll take questions outside. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.